888 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council to order this evening, and I would like to do so by asking the town clerk to call the roll. Present. Thank you very much. A lot of times uh, I would like to entertain a motion to accept the minutes of the July 11th meeting, July 11th, 1988. So moved. It's been moved and seconded to uh, adopt the minutes. All those in favor? Any opposed? Unanimously. Also, I'd like to entertain a motion to uh, accept the minutes of the August 3rd, 1988 meeting. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Any opposition? No. So they've been unanimously uh, adopted. Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to bring up at this time any citizens' discussion of items that are not on the agenda. We now have this at the beginning of our meetings and at the end of our meetings. So if there's anyone who'd like to address something that is not on the agenda, this would be the time to do so. Seeing no one coming forward, I would ask for if we have any from the councillors, any reports or correspondence, either any reports from any committees that you might sit on or correspondence you'd like to bring before the rest of us. Councillor Jordan? I have, I have a little item here that I think that would be nice if we recognized. It's a student that graduated from Cape Elizabeth High School this June, and uh, he got recognized in the Sports Illustrated, which I feel is a prestigious magazine. Brandon Kelly. Brandon Kelly recently graduated from Cape Elizabeth High School hit a home run in each of four consecutive at-bats in a game with York, and they won 11 to 1, 11, I mean 11 to 10. He has six RBIs in the game and finished the season with a 396 batting average and five home runs. And I've also done a little check in there, and I understand that is the first in the state for a high school student to do that, and the 17th in the country and also the, when they had their Hall of Fame meeting here recently, they recognized him with a plaque. Now, to me, that's quite an honor. There's uh, five others here recognized from Missouri to Oregon to California and Utah. And uh, there's one other here from Alabama. So I think it's quite an honor, and I think the manager or uh, maybe the chairman of the council should have send him a little note and congratulate him for what he achieved. Very good. I'd be glad to do so. That is, that is an honor to gain that kind of national stature. So. And now that he's done that, I think he's, there's a student from Westbrook that had six home runs in six consecutive times at bat in two different games. I hope in the morning paper. <coughs> I just hope Joe Morgan of the Red Sox is listening tonight, <laughs> and we'll watch the tape delay of this. Do you want me to mention the Red Sox? <laughs> I, I had to put a little plug in for the Red Sox. Yes, Councilor I have a copy of a letter I received from Peter Lampshire, which is in your packet that was given to you this evening, just expressing um, his major concerns about Cape Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other reports? If not, I'd like to make a report on a meeting that I attended uh, on July 21st, 1988. I attended a meeting as town council chair. I was asked to attend a meeting which was regarding National Lighthouse Day. Congress declared recently in a joint resolution that August 7th, 1989 will be National Lighthouse Day. And what we'll be doing is commemorating the 200th anniversary of the commissioning of the first lighthouse by the federal government. The Lighthouse Preservation Society is a group of people who uh, believe very much in lighthouse, hi lighthouse history, preservation, and, and the like. And they are pushing to have the Portland Headlight right here at our own Fort Williams to become the location for the national designation of the national ceremony. There's three reasons that they would like it at the Portland Headlight, as, as they've explained it to me. One is that it is one of the few that's adjoined by a park where people can actually come into the park, et cetera. Many are off on uh, inaccessible to the public areas. Another is that it's naturally one of the most photographed in the country, thus it's one of the most popular. And the third is, is its dramatic setting on, on the rock-bound coast of Maine. It's just, not only is it accessible to people, but it's one of the most beautifully set. So for that reason, they've called together a meeting, and attending that meeting was myself, Henry Adams from the Fort Williams Committee, two representatives of the Lighthouse Preservation Society, Coast Guard representative, 
uh, Stephen Hart from Senator Mitchell's office, and two representatives from Trident Associates, which is a group that would help the Lighthouse Preservation Society put on this event. The key to the meeting that I wanted to bring before my fellow counselors and the public uh, of Cape Elizabeth is that if over the next few weeks the Portland Headlight receives from Washington, D.C. the official designation to be the site of this commemoration, then we will be asked as a council to accept and to give permission to having this festivity at the Portland Headlight, or rather at Fort Williams, which adjoins the Portland Headlight. The Lighthouse Preservation Society would be in charge of this National Lighthouse Day, assisted by Trident Associates, the group from Brunswick that I mentioned earlier. I do also want to emphasize that uh, Henry Adams and myself and others within the town have emphasized to them it's important that we want local input, and this group does want local input, so I'm sure a local committee would be formed to uh, have certain responsibilities regarding this National Lighthouse Day and to provide input in a place for the citizens to provide input. And I would. If we do adopt that, I would hope that many people in the town would get involved in this, in this tremendous honor. It would most likely, it's not definite, but it would be most likely a three-day celebration, which would be Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, August 5th, 6th, and 7th, with the actual uh, ceremonies in terms of the commemoration being uh, sometime around noon on Monday, August 7th. I, once again, it's not on tonight's agenda, but I wanted to fully uh, brief you on this situation, because once we receive, if we should receive the national designation, we will be, uh, it will be on either the September or the October agenda for your vote. So this is, this is the background. If there's any questions, I'd be glad to entertain them. And, and this committee that I mentioned will continue to meet, and then we'll be forming an adjunct uh, Cape Elizabeth committee as well. So seeing so no questions? Uh, yes. An occasional burst of propane. For regular conditions, uh, propane will, will run us uh, per person per hour, six gallons. So out of our 30 yes, gallons, for us, yes. uh, three average so, size people will, mm -hmm. will get That's away right. with, uh, you know, an hour and, and a half. It is, it is one of the most historic, and uh, there's, there's a lot of history, I'm sure, that will be forthcoming more and more yeah, about it. As a matter of fact, part of this festivity is they'd like to have some booths regarding for the, reason the history of our lighthouse, look the history overhead. of other lighthouses. And so it'll be, it'll be a very educational festival as well. There's many groups from around the country that will be participating wherever this National Lighthouse Day is held. So Under we'll, we'll be keeping you in You'd be up here by yourself. What are some of the yeah. things you think about when you're out here below? Uh, the peacefulness uh, of it. I believe there's one in Go aloft to our uh, maximums and all. We'd, uh, well, that's the other one. That we could go up right and now. shut down our, our pilot lights, which is good practice, as well as a uh, nice thing. It's quiet. It's, it's just like being in a gas balloon there. There is. We, we weren't the first to somewhat. Uh, right. There was. I think the way it's a catalog. Right. While we're enjoying the beauty of the but countryside, the, right. the chase crew is looking out for our balloon. So we wanted to uh, keep the citizens and the councilors aware of the situation, and we'll continue to report on. Chase along, this is hot fun. How copy okay, VHF? Uh, next I would like to have the, pub the beginning of the public hearing regarding the rezoning request at Eastfield. What we have here is, in regards to S. Plummer Incorporated, a request to rezone lots 127, 130, 131, 132, and 144 from the RP zone to the RA zone. We'll be there. We'll be there when you land. At this time, I would like to ask if there's any members of the public that would like to speak, please come to the microphone and also give your name and address. Would anyone like to speak on this issue, which is later item 21 that we'll be voting on, but at this time, the council would like public input. Okay, we're going to go in, we're just yes. going to bounce a little bit, and then I'm going to pull My name is Peggy McGeehy. I'm here on behalf of uh, F.S. Plumber Company, Inc., and Fred S. Plumber. They're both our owners of uh, different lots within the East Field subdivision. Uh, we would like to go forward with a presentation both on factual issues and some of the legal issues, um, providing a little bit of background for you. Some people up to date where things it are. It was like a flight uh, on the wings of an eagle. And as the I ground rushes the up to meet has us, before it, uh, the so planning the board group. recommendation, which is from the town council, referred to the matter. That I would say for comment uh, following the uh, discussion of the facts of the case. But the job's not finished yet. We still have to deflate the. We had provided and pack to the uh, town councilors uh, a packet uh, last week. Uh, which is essentially a duplicate of the Passers packet that had been uh, submitted to hand. the planning board. Uh, in addition, there was a letter uh, from uh, me as counsel. Joe, how long does it take you? Plumber Company, I couldn't Fred hear Palmer. some of the audio on uh, that, so I don't know if the answer has already been additional, given. Additional documents how long does it take you to inflate the balloon and get it ready to go up? Uh, 
soils uh, out here. When we do it with passengers, we'll we point out how safe they, they are and we kind of help them. Lot. They participate in putting the balloon um, up. And doing it expediently but not rushing it and pointing things out and answering questions. I'd say 15, 15 minutes, maybe 20. Well, that's not that any long, then. Oh, no. no. Is and it light when you're doing like this, or is it still dark? Uh, well, we can fly before dark if we bring we running will be lights, referring but to usually we do it about 45 minutes after daybreak, so it's light. Yeah. Brian, I noticed um, there were quite a few people. Oh, the gondola, one thing I would like call? to mention uh, first. Basket, yeah. yeah, the basket. Trying there to hold the basket when it landed to keep to it from dragging. There seems to confusion throughout. Are you alone trying to stop this, or do you have other help? Proceedings before planning board, in any case. Well, most of the time, between wetland designation and resource protection uh, zone. Uh, as the uh, council knows, wetlands designation does not prohibit building. There is a limitation, and there are, is a procedure through which uh, home builders must go through, such as uh, applying for a wetlands alteration permit. With a resource protection zone classification, there can be no building at all. And what we have here is a, a a subdivision established in the 1960s, uh, and certain lots have now been rendered completely unbuildable uh, as a matter of the ordinance, uh, as opposed to simply going through a wetlands alteration permit process. Uh, the um, company and Mr. Plummer had um, applied to the planning board for uh, a removal of the wetlands designation as well as resource protection uh, zone designation, uh, hoping to for the sake of efficiency, uh, go through both of those. Um, at the request of the board, uh, that wetlands, uh, the petition to remove the wetlands designation was, was uh, withdrawn uh, to be um, resolved uh, separately. Uh, I mentioned that at the onset because there are discussions and there are constant references to whether these lots are wetlands or not. And we are not saying that the lots at issue are not wet in any place. Uh, they are wet in part, uh, certainly. Uh, but the question is whether they should be properly classified as resource protection zone areas. Uh, we seek the removal of the RP zone because we think it is an error as a matter of fact and as a matter of law. Uh, the uh, factual issues which um, uh, Mr. Uh, Plummer, Mark Plummer, who is with me this evening, uh, president of FS Plummer Company, uh, Inc., and son of Fred uh, uh, Plummer, uh, will testify to is that the petitioners did get no notice of the rezoning. Uh, uh, the notice that you have uh, in your packet uh, demonstrates that uh, there's nothing, there's no reference to an RP zone being established. It talks more or less about, uh, I believe, certain topsoils uh, being removed. Uh, there are also representations made uh, by the town that these lots were buildable up through uh, into uh, 1987. As a matter of fact, it wasn't until 1987 that the petitioners learned that these uh, lots were in the RP zone. Two other factual issues. Uh, the uh, resource protection district we found out through the planning board process uh, was established on the basis of whether there was Sebago mucky peat in the lots or not. And the only testimony before the planning board was that there was no Sebago mucky peat in those lots, and they should not, as a matter of fact, have been classified uh, as RP. Finally, we do have submitted uh, to the council uh, two appraisal uh, letters from Easton Appraisal Company. One talks about the value of the lots as buildable lots, which is in the range of $65,000. And all, then the other letter talks about the value of the lots were they to be not buildable, and those uh, values are in the area of $400. That's a difference of 99, over 99%. Uh, I will uh, defer now to uh, Mr. Plummer and come back with uh, a comment uh, on the uh, planning board uh, recommendation and some of the legal issues. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mark Plummer. I'm president of the FS Plummer Company. And frankly, I have to tell you, <clears throat> I really just don't want to be here tonight. Uh, my father, with other people back in the 60s, had lots approved. Uh, they met all of the criteria at that time for the comprehensive plan. 
and I just don't think we should have to be here tonight. I think that occurred because in 1981, inadvertently or not, I don't know, the town of Cape Elizabeth published a notice like that that frankly doesn't mention RP zone at all. Now, everybody in the town of Cape Elizabeth, that town, had to know that the FS Plumber Company was owner of those lots and what we did for a living. It, that notice speaks of removal of topsoil and changing of some areas in town in the RA zone. It does not mention RP at all, period. I don't think you're in the business of <clears throat> uh, changing zones. I think you're in the business of creating zones. And how big were those zones? I think they're very small areas in the town of Pittsburgh when you created the RP zone in this town. We were just never notified. Absolutely, period, not notified that that happened. We think the lots today are buildable. There is no Sebago Maki Peat. Sebago Maki Peat has 53 or 55 inches of humus topsoil, organic material. They just aren't there. We've dug test holes. They are not there. There's other types of soils like togas and walpole and all that. Very buildable soils as far as residential construction goes. Um, I guess the, uh, the other thing that really uh, bothers me uh, is that in November of 1985, I was approached by the Portland Water District on behalf of the town of Cape Elizabeth about an easement across one of those lots. I think it was lot number uh, 27. The story I was given was that <clears throat> if we don't get an easement from you, we don't put in the sewer down to the ocean. Flat statement. We gave the town of Cape Elizabeth an easement across the corner of that lot for sewer lines. Uh, checked with the town several times. Never saw a map with an RP zone designation on it. Never. Uh, it went on for several months. Finally, sometime around February, the Portland Water District threatened me with uh, a taking. And I told uh, the young gentleman from the Portland Water District, you take that land by eminent domain and you'll be in court forever. Really because their attorneys were screwing around with the deed. Excuse me, messing around with the deed. Finally around the middle of March, I, ne I executed the deed on behalf of the FS Plumber Company for no dollars. As a gift, if you want to call it that, we felt we had a responsibility to the town to do that. And we did it. If you go into the building inspector's office today and you look at the tax maps, at least the last time I looked at the tax maps, and I was over and I looked at those tax maps several times during that whole process from November of 1985 until the middle of March of 1986. There was absolutely no designation of an RP zone in those tax maps. On April 1, 1986, new tax maps were delivered I guess, to the town, and on those tax maps was superimposed the RP zone on those lots. Don't know if that means anything. I'll tell you one thing. It really kind of sticks in our craw that that happened. Uh, we think those lots are buildable. We think they were approved by the town of Cape Elizabeth and met all the requirements of the town at the time. A couple of other points that really haven't been brought out a lot uh, on the upper side of lot number 32 is a six inch pipe that uh, feeds a spring in the adjoining lot which runs uncontrolled across lots 31 and 32. There's also roughly a 15 inch or 12 inch pipe that dumps all the storm water off from the road system up on Highland Road onto those two lots. Uh, again, I didn't even know that was there. I didn't know that the uh, six inch pipe was there until several months ago. Um, 
I think probably some of that vegetation and whatever that's growing on that pot is probably forced because as you get down the lots, there's sort of a dish affair, so it takes some time for the water to dissipate from the lots. And frankly, the RP zone just renders those lots worthless. Uh, two of the major lots, 31 and 32, are not owned by the plumber company. They're owned by Fred Plumber and have been for several years, many years. And I guess at this time, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Continuing with the public hearing now. Oh, Thanks. go ahead. Act three. Very good. <laughs> I just want to comment on some of those factual issues that were uh, presented to, to the town council by Mr. Plummer. Uh, the fact that there was no notice, of course, presents a, an issue of due process. Uh, the fact that there were representations made, affirmative representations made uh, over the course of years that uh, these lots were buildable and property rights were deeded in reliance on those representations presents an equity issue. Uh, the, we have an error of fact as well because the Sebago Mucky Peat designation, which is the underpinning of the Resource Protection Zone, uh, does not apply in this case. There is no Sebago Mucky Peat, as I say, the, as I mentioned uh, to the uh, council. The only evidence before uh, the planning board and what we, what we believe so far this evening is the town council um, is that um, the uh, soils. Uh, in, on these lots are a variety, constitute a variety of so soils, the Walpole and the Togas, et cetera, but not uh, Sebago Mucky Peat. Uh, I would refer to the council to the uh, planning board's recommendation with the findings of fact. Uh, it has an A, B, and a C. Uh, C uh, discusses the uh, Sebago Mucky Peat designation. At the planning board, we discussed the uh, zoning ordinance provision which brought these lots into the resource protection district. There are uh, four standards by, or criteria by, by which a land could become a resource protection uh, district. One was any land, one is any land situated within 250 feet of Great Pond, Little Pond, or Causeway Brook, which we don't have in this situation. The uh, second criterion was, uh, that is, any land situated within 100 feet of the Alewife Brook. The third criterion is any land within the limits of the Spurwink Marsh. Either of those uh, criteria uh, fit this situation. And the fourth one is all other land so designated on the official zoning map. And our question was, it seems like a fairly broad standard. It goes on to say, and any apparent wetlands contiguous there too. But first, you need to know the basis for which the other land so designated in the map is established before you even look at contiguous wetlands. So our question to the board was, what's the basis for making a, a lots of RP zone anyway? Uh, when they, uh, when it all says is other land so designated. Is it just an arbitrary decision? Well, the planning board uh, also was curious about how our, the RP zone was established. and. Uh, requested and authorized uh, us to go back uh, and uh, look into it um, as well as uh, certain uh, uh, Cape Elizabeth officials. And uh, it turned out that the basis for establishing the RP zone uh, in this situation was uh, whether or not there was a bagel mucky peat. Uh, with that, that regard, uh, the, uh, town co the council has before it uh, two um, uh, minutes uh, provided uh, to us by Dr. Ran. Uh, one is the uh, Conservation Commission minutes, and the other one is the Comprehensive Planning Committee uh, minutes back in 1978, which talks about extending the Resource Protection Zone, and this is the first page of the Conservation Commission minutes, to extend the Resource Protection Zone as it would apply to all future development to all areas of Sebago Mucky Peat as defined on the Cumberland County Soils map. Uh, we had occasion to speak with Dr. Rand, and uh, he indicated that yes, so the, where there was a bago mucky peat, where the line was drawn on the, uh, the soil survey, the Cumberland County Soil Survey, that was where the Resource Protection uh, District uh, was established. We had uh, a soils engineer uh, analyze uh, the lots 
and uh, determine where there was a bagel monkey peat and where there was not. There was no Sebago monkey peat anywhere. The planning board uh, recommendation states, however, that lot 3132, and this is uh, number D, page 2 of the uh, recommendation, the minutes of April 1988, 3132 meet the definition of Sebago monkey peat. Now, that is an ultimate statement without uh, indicating what evidence there was to uh, establish that. Uh, the uh, findings go forward to say uh, the Sebago Mucky Peat Soils designation in the Cumberland County Soil Survey applies to a broad category of organic soils types, including toga soils. Well, we, we referred back to the uh, soil survey to see if that was the case and uh, do not see that that's referred to, uh, toga soils are referred to at all. Uh, Sebago Mucky Peat, on page 32 of the survey, uh, refers to, describes the bagel monkey peat, as uh, uh, Mr. Plummer uh, stated, it's essentially 54 inches of peat, another uh, 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 matter uh, up to about 60 inches, and includes in the mapping small areas of Ridgebury, Saugatuck, Walpole, and Whitman soils, not the toga soils that we have uh, indicated by, by the um, uh, Mr. Stinson, uh, soils engineer. Therefore, we assert that as a matter of fact, these, these lots should never have been classified as resource protection zone in the first place, based on this uh, uh, criterion. Uh, finally, there is the issue of, of whether this is a taking or not. Uh, the law court has been clear on the question of taking. When you have a substantial diminution in the value, you can't even build on it then you have a taking. Uh, I've provided the uh, case law to uh, Cape Elizabeth Town Council in this matter. What we have uh, provided uh, to the Town Council uh, are two letters, as we mentioned before, uh, from Eastern Appraisal Company that shows that the diminution of value is uh, greater than 99% uh, for uh, those lots uh, were they to be rendered unbuildable. Uh, no further uh, comments uh, from us at this time. If there are any questions, we'd be glad to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. Continuing the public hearing on item 21. My name is Robert Pierce. I live at 24 Highview Road in Cape Elizabeth in what is known as the Eastfield area. I am reading from a covering letter which was sent to each of the uh, town council members dated August 2, 1988, which letter I believe summarizes the concerns of the residents of the area. Dear council member, you will find enclosed a packet representing years of documents supporting the Eastfield RP zone. You may refer to the maps which come from town ordinances, <coughs> town conservation, and the town comprehensive plans. Also enclosed is a document from Hundabaloo for the town's pollution control facilities. This packet may provide an overall picture of our concerns for upholding all town RP zones, as well as presenting the history and general conditions of the Eastfield wetland area. Please bring this packet with you to the August 8th public hearing for purposes of reference. The information in this packet was compiled with the assistance of state and federal agencies, including the Army Corps of Engineers, DPA, DEP, and EPA, and various conservation groups. There is a question of illegal filling on lots 27 and 30. F.S. Plummer has been served two notices by the Army Corps of Engineers and the EPA to cease all filling of the Eastfield wetland area. The EPA has been to the site and has started photo documentations of lots 27 and 30. Recently, wetland vegetation has regenerated through the layers of fill on lots 27 and 30 and has been documented by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The building and development potential of the area has already been realized by F.S. Plummer, who was a partner in the business venture in 1964 when the original 35 homes were built. Even at that time, the development of the area resulted in severe water table problems, which had to be corrected by drainage channels at the town's expense. 
This was and remains a fragile watershed area. Due to its close proximity to the ocean, its natural filtration function must not be disturbed to assure that no sediments from filling affect the coastal waters. Section 404 of the EPA federal regulations clearly addresses this environmental concern. When the sewer system was installed, no stubs were to be placed in RP zones. See the enclosed letter from town manager. This, however, occurred in the Eastfield RP zone. Residents are also greatly concerned with midnight dumping of fill. A rising water table since the building of an F.S. Plummer home on Lot 44, the first construction since the late 1960s, has area residents greatly alarmed. There is evidence of flooding at the neighborhood school bus stop, and complaints have been made to the DPW, to the DPW concerning street erosion and safety hazards during winter icing conditions. Fill should not be the criterion for changing RP zone boundaries. This is a dangerous precedent that could result in town-wide financial, environmental, and legal ramifications. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to continue on with the public hearing. If we could, would, I think I'll, we'll let just people continue and then you can come back up. Uh, my name is Deborah Botello, and I live at 26 Highview Road. Our home abuts lot 27 of the RP zone. I have therefore had the opportunity to observe the conditions on the zone firsthand, and especially those on lots 27 and 30. These lots are of special interest to me because I understand that filling, illegal and otherwise, has been taking place in these lots for quite a few years, and questions have arisen now as to whether or not the character of the wetlands has changed or altered as a result of this filling. Now, to begin with, logically, it seems unthinkable that what is beneath the surface of the soil is going to be influenced by what is scraped off, spread over, or fill in on top of the lot, the lots in question. If this were true, I could then scrape the top vegetation off of my front lawn, fill in the area with sand, plant a cactus, and reclassify my lot as a desert land. And, of course, this is absurd. However, I have been witness to this type of reasoning on several occasions in the past year. I maintain, as do wetland experts, Mr. Doug Titus of IEP, for example, that filling does not make unbuildable soil buildable. When Mr. Titus walked the RP area, including lots 27 and 30, he assured me that the soil characteristics, water table, and natural runoff function of the area had remained unchanged. Uh, what filling does accomplish is greater dispersion of groundwater, which causes area flooding, and pollution of coastal waters when the natural filtration process is disturbed. Our home has a sump pump that pumps clean, clear groundwater 12 months of the year. Even in freezing weather and during dry spells, there is water just beneath our foundation. This is true of many homes in the Eastfield area. When our home was built, the backyard was filled extensively along the area that borders Lot 27. We have sinkholes, and the wetland vegetation routinely chokes out that area of our back lawn. Recently, I have found evidence of wetland vegetation regenerating through the layers of fill on lots 27 and 30. This uh, growth is attracting deer, once again, to the partially filled lots of 27 and 30. I numbered samples of the vegetation and sent it to be analyzed by the Department of Agriculture. Please refer to the list in your packets. Uh, I also have pictures of the regenerative process, which I'll pass along to you. This shows uh, species such as scouring rush, broadleaf fern, and canary reed sprouting up right through the layers of fill. The character of the area is regenerating itself, which comes as no surprise to anyone who knows or lives near a wetland area. Nature really does prevail, and she deserves our respect. Once a wetland, always a wetland. Lot 27's appearance was altered recently when the new Peebles Point Road was made. Mr. Plummer wanted the beginning of the road at the Highview end um, moved several yards south after he had granted an easement and the initial filling had been done. The second and most recent entrance, the one we use now, to the road was then created. This left Lot 27 with a rather odd look. Uh, with the old entrance still visible, but an island of intact wetland soil and vegetation between the two entrances. There's a picture here you can see very clearly. Uh, please support us in your efforts to keep our 
RP zone and all CAPE RP zones intact. Our efforts were supported by the Planning Board in a unanimous vote, and we ask your support to further protect our RP zone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Continuing with the public hearing. My name is Larry Botello, and I live at 26 Highview Road. And I'd like to take a few moments to discuss the issue of the RP zone from both a financial and a historical point of view. Although the lots within the RP zone were valued at unbuildable lot rates, they are now and they always have been valued at a much lower rate than comparable unbuildable lots. The differences average to about one-third the usual value of a buildable lot. In 1979, the land was valued at $4,000 a lot. This means a yearly payment of about $50 a, year, a lot. At present, the fee is about $120 per lot, and apparently, a rather minimal rate has been paid on the lots for years. Historically, the zone has always been wetlands. I have two cottages at Peebles Cove. And my wife's family has lived there for many years, and we know the area well. And two years ago, we bought our house on Highview Road with the understanding that it was next to a designated RP zone that could not be further developed. The RP zone has, like Peebles Cove, a honeycomb of natural springs. Lot number 32 is in the location of the original spring and the source of the drinking water for the old Peebles farm. The original developers saw the futility of further development due to the wetland conditions, and they used the RP area for purposes of drainage for the shore acre development. At this time, I would like to pass out to you a copy of the original document concerning this transaction for the easement. And we ask that you add that to the packet that we submitted earlier. And in conclusion, I would like to point out that Durigo Builders had the opportunity to fill the lots in 1964 when an ordinance would have allowed the builder to fill in the area. They could wait a year and then put in septic systems. Obviously, realizing that the soils were simply too wet to be suitably buildable, they declined. For these reasons, I feel that the RP zone should and must be left intact. Thank you. Here's a cup. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to come forward? Hello, um, my name is Keith French. I live at 21 Eastfield Road, which is right on the corner, the lowest lot in the area, in fact. I'm speaking tonight as a fairly unhappy resident because we have lived in this house for six years, and we have been very pleased to have had a dry basement for six years, until two months ago, when it started getting wet for the first time. Um, Mrs. Panansky, who lives on lot 25, there she is, <laughs> has lived here for, what, 15 years? 16 years. This is the first time in 15 years that her basement is wet. Lot 27 has been extensively filled just this past year, as has uh, lot 44. There's been some fill illegally dumped on lot 29. Uh, there's also been some additional fill put in lot 30. Um, I mean, the coincidence is pretty devastating. I mean, I really, I, this is the dry season. I can't wait for winter and spring. Um, the, the water table is simply, my suspicion is that it's simply backing up. The, there's all this water that has been absorbed by this uh, wet area, which now can no longer, uh, the volume has been reduced and the water table is backing up through the system. You can ask 
some long-term residents down the other end of Eastfield um, in who have lived there since as early as 1964. And they'll tell you that in the early years of this development, water problems were horrendous. Uh, septic systems didn't work. There was just water every place. Uh, the town has since um, put in drains. Uh, there has been a drainage easement. I have the deed here, which is supposed to be perpetually maintained by the, by the town down to Peebles Cove for the purpose of draining the area. Finally, things have, have um, pretty well gotten under control. Uh, very relatively few water problems over the past few years. When the sewer was built, additional drainage improvements were made along Eastfield Road at town expense. Now, here we go. We're filling. We're destroying the balance. It's going to, if filling continues up the lots, the additional lots, even the ones that aren't RP, I fear, really, that every house up and down Eastfield Road is going to have water problems. And that's a real problem for a lot of those houses, which are splits, and their bottom floor is living space. I think you're going to have some angry people talking to you if those lots, if any of those lots, are allowed to be built. Um, it just, it makes me angry that the same developer, you know, he's, I know he's not, he's not doing it maliciously. I mean, he's being a developer. I mean, he's, I mean, I've worked with Mark Plummer, uh, which, uh, you know, he, He's, he's doing his best to, you know, he's, he's developing lots, he, he's making a profit on his land. But it's important that the town become, it, and I, I mean, I'm a landscape architect, I do work around the state, I work with a lot of developers, and the regulations are getting stricter and stricter. And they should, because of problems like this. Um, but the same developer, uh, you know, F.S. Plummer, basically, Dorigo and F.S. Plummer are really one and the same. They're going to fill up the remaining lots and they're going to, they're going to mess up the balance, uh, which is, has existed fairly well over the last, say, 15 years. Um, I guess I would have one thing I'd like to mention in terms of the other lots, the ones that are not on the RP zone, is the fact that at the public hearing before the planning board, back in February. Um, a fellow from IEP, which I guess is a soils, wetlands um, analysis uh, type of organization from New Hampshire, um, a fellow named Doug Titus spoke. Unfortunately, it was skipped on the minutes because for some reason it, um, uh, something went wrong with the tape. But uh, I think Marianne Guthrie would, would <laughs> concur that uh, he suggested, without having been able to study those because his, um, he wasn't hired to do it, uh, he suggested that those other lots also be included in RP uh, or were definitely unbuildable because of their wet condition. That's something that uh, uh, George Schumann, another resident on Eastfield Road, was going to mention. He's not here today because of illness. Um, I guess in, in, in uh, conclusion, well, I'd just like to say that um, I'd, I'd like the, the council, because of my own basement condition, to see that, that lot 27, as well as the fill in lot 29, uh, be, be restored, that those lots be restored to their original condition, because I, I believe that those are causing my current basement problems. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, I'd like to hand these out. This is the deed, which is the drainage easement uh, purchased by the town to, to Peebles Cove. <clears throat> Hi. Hi. My name is Carl Westerveltz. I live at 33 Highview Road. And I'd like to comment a little bit about the, uh, the nature of the property that exists in lot 32, which is adjacent. Uh, to our home. The, uh, one of the attractions when we purchased our home approximately two, a little more than two years ago, was the uh, natural environment that existed there. 
the type of wildlife that we understood from some of the neighbors that existed there. Uh, and we've seen that over the last two years. Uh, we've seen pheasant, we've seen deer, we've seen uh, a lot of the types of animals that we would also expect to see in, uh, in basically uh, an extreme wetland situation. And that is something that uh, we feel is there for a long term, as long as the land doesn't get uh, adjusted in any way or, or tampered with. And part of that has to do with, as has been mentioned already, some of the springs that exist on both our property and lot 32 with constant draining of, of running water and, uh, and green growing vegetation throughout the course of the year, throughout 12 months of the year. Does not, does not adjust and does not die during the winter months, or at least it did not last year. And uh, that was an understanding that we had that these lots were as well RP protected land when we purchased the house and uh, was another one of the attractions in, uh, in moving in to lot 33. Thank you. Thank you. Any other citizens like to come forward during this uh, public hearing? My name is Joan French. I live on 21 Eastfield Road. Uh, you've heard many aspects to consider tonight on the RP zone. Uh, I, we ask you that you do uphold the planning board uh, decision, which was unanimous. They went through extensive um, study about it. It's been mentioned many times. There wasn't a wetlands expert who came and studied it. Um, I guess I, I rather take excep exception to uh, the statement that there was no real or proper notification about the uh, RP zone. Uh, if you walk right into the uh, building uh, inspector's office, you can go there now, you can go there years ago, there was a map that is rather large, it's a good 20 or 30 inches by 18 or 20 inches, actually probably even larger than that, which very clearly, and it was made, and it's stated 1981, and it uh, shows all the RP zones, and it also shows that beyond the RP zone in our area is wetland vegetation. Um, doesn't take too much to just turn your head and take a look at the map. Um, I also take exception to the constant reference to is it Sebago Mucky Peat or not Sebago Mucky Peat, and that's the criterion. I think we really only have to read our ordinances. In fact, we even start with our um, comprehensive plan. This is a comprehensive plan that was made in 1980, uh, for 1980. And it states very clearly uh, on page, I'm sure all the council members are familiar with it, on land use plan. And uh, it talks about the resource protection zone. And it mentions that um, the RP zones are not simply uh, Sebago Mucky Peak. They are coastal dunes, they are tidal marshes, they are Sebago mucky peat, they are slopes that are greater than 25% and RP zones um, and other RP zones. And they also start to mention in the back part a lot about watersheds and that's exactly what we have in, in our area. Our area is a watershed that serves between um, Peebles and shore acres. We also have in our comprehensive plan of 1980 a map where they uh, marked out the areas that were uh, Sebago, Mucky Peach. Did they mark our area? No, they didn't. Uh, I don't know if any of you have your comprehensive plan with you, but our area is not marked as Sebago, Mucky Peach, so that really isn't a contention that they're dealing with. But then you go over to the other map and they say proposed zoning and ours is in there, a proposed zone for um, an RP zone. 
Is ours the only one? Was that a mistake? No, there are other areas that were the same thing, where it's over on Eastman Road. So that was not their reasoning of um, Sebago, Mucky Peat. Uh, in this business of Sebago and Togus, Togus is really another form of uh, muck and peat. It's just not 51 inches. It's probably only about 24 or 30 inches. Give it a few years and it will grow. Uh, the, um, uh, as far as the RP zone is really concerned, Cape Elizabeth was under uh, a state of Maine guidelines. It was a mandatory shoreline zoning ordinance. They had to comply with it. And it said, uh, resource protection district, criteria for establishing the districts. A resource protection district includes areas in which development would adversely affect water quality, productive habitat, biotic systems, scenic or natural values. This district shall include inland or coastal wetlands as defined in section 13, and specifically areas rated as moderate to high waterfall uh, value areas. So Cape Elizabeth had to follow this. It had no choice. And they took a good look at it by 1980 and realized this is one area that is very valuable. Um, yes, the, uh, the soils expert from uh, the developer has come in and said it's uh, Scantic and Walpole and every other type of, well, no, I shouldn't say every other, um, but Scantic and Walpole and Swanton soil. Here's the same survey. If you look under Scantic soil, you can find very clearly it states it. Scantic soil is non, uh, um, as far as residential on a public sewer system, I see that's Swanton. I will read Swanton, that's in there. Very severe, high water table, differential settling in place, places and frost action. St scantic soil, severe, high water table, excessive wetness, frost action, low shear strength, if, uh, as far as putting it on residents on a public sewerage system. And the uh, same thing goes with Walpole. In fact, even the state, we have lots of information here, <sighs> even the state has um, a list of what are considered uh, wetland soil, Swanton, Scantic, they all, they all come on here as, uh, as far as the state is concerned. Uh, even if you look at the area, uh, in fact, uh, reference was made in the beginning about um, when, the, when the sewer was put in, and you all have it in your packet, of um, uh, what type of soil. For when, the, when the sewer was put in, the town hired a geologist to come and take a look at the soil. And they said that uh, Lower Eastfield was of scantic and not buildable soil. And that was as recently as 1979. Um, so it's pretty well documented. In here it's documented as being muck and peat. Um, and scantic soil, actually, but we'll take Swanton also. Okay, the other thing that I, I'd like to mention is uh, the video. I'm sure you've all heard about the video. You know about it, but it is important. Um, we live there, uh, to go there, and we do appreciate people who have taken the time and effort to come out to it. But it is an area that really has to be viewed through the seasons. Um, and we, living there, see exactly what goes on around there. So uh, I'd like to take this opportunity just to present a short video about it. Could you pull it back a bit? Pardon? Could you pull the table I'll pull back? It back. Let's go down. If there's a way, technically, people in our production booth where we can pick this up for the people at home, we, I would see they're scurrying back there making decisions even as we speak.
Dimension of the stream, here it is, it goes on lot 31 and 32. Good running water. Despite the fact that it's snowing, so it's obviously below freezing, there's the vegetation that um, Carl Westerville mentioned. It still shows the fish is moss. And now we're just oriented to where we are. Swing up and around. around and there's the house that was built on lot 34. Just showing you that we're on Eastfield Road. So he rolled his pants up. 
thinking, why take a chance? <laughs> down I go. And it's down. Basically, uh, up to his knee. Up to his knee. <laughs> okay, where does all that water, the fruit of draining, where does it come from? It comes from, from underneath the compassion. It also comes from the side of the lot 29. Here it is. You see some of that fill there? That's lot 29. That's what it looks like. Salt. Water. Okay, this is just a, that's just a little rough here. That was orienting you to the fact that we're on the street of the uh, road. Okay, what exists in the back part of lot three? Oh no, I'm sorry. Uh, this is a uh, uh, digging of a Here we go. Here's what exists in the back of lot three. Water. All over. I guess I'd, I'd just like to say, I'll let you settle. I, I guess I, I would just like to conclude with a, a quote that we have from our comprehensive plan in 1980 on the last page. It came from a judicial review. And it says that, quote, an owner of land has no absolute and unlimited right to change the essential natural character of his land so as to use it for a purpose for which it was unsuited in its natural state and which injures the rights of others, unquote, and excerpted from the Just versus Marinac County. And I think that pretty well sums up uh, the feeling of, of everyone in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, a petition was circulated and over 200, about 200 signatures really are saying to Planning Board Town Councils, keep your RP zone. Thank you. Thank you very much.
We are continuing the public hearing regarding uh, what will be item 21 on our agenda. Is there any further public comment? Okay, if there's no further, further public comment, I would like to, oh, there is, I'm sorry. Uh, I'd like to go back to the first gentleman that spoke. The FS Plumber Company Incorporated has never been a partner in Durago Builders. Wrong statement. The FS Plumber Company has not, to my knowledge, ever filled lot number 27. If fill occurred in lot number 27, the Portland Water District and the Town of Cape Elizabeth, <coughs> the Corps of Engineers, and the EPA put that fill on there on the easement that I unfortunately granted the town of Cape Elizabeth. We have not put fill on that lot. Back in the early 60s, I'm sure when they were developing that subdivision, it was fill put on those lots. Our soils people have told us that. There's fill in those lots, but that was back in 1964 or 5 or whenever it was. I don't know. The plumber company has not put fill on lot number 27, ever. The neighbors have dumped their Christmas trees on there and a bunch of other debris. That's true. I agree with that. Right on the top. Go over there tonight and look at them. Lot number 30. Lot number 30 is a corner lot. Lot number 30 is right there. Eastfield Road, <coughs> Highview Road. You go up around at the end. This is the right of way down to the ocean. Now, lot number 30 also has fill on it. I'm sure again, way back in the 60s, when they developed that subdivision, according to our soils people and according to the reports you have and we gave to the planning board, this fill in that lot. Some of that fill is 25 years old. Now I'll tell you right now, the other fill the last 18 inches to 30 inches of fill was put there by Portland Water District, the Town of Cape Elizabeth, Corps of Engineers, EPA, whoever had anything to do with the installation of that sewer in Eastfield. What they did, without my permission, I didn't know about it <clears throat> after I rode over there one day and uh, saw these mounds of sewer pipe and manholes stockpiled on lot number 30. They hauled in fill, a lot of fill. 95% of the lot was filled in 19, whenever they put the sewer in, 1986. All those citizens that spoke stood there and watched that fill placed there. I'm sure they must have. It's beside the point. We did not put any fill on lot number 30. We did not put any fill on lot number 27, ever. Lot number 29, yes, we did. I think there are two or three lots of sand or gravel there, whatever it is. We had every, <clears throat> every intention of building a home on that lot. We have a right, according to the ordinance, as long as we keep it under 5,000 square feet, to put fill on that lot, up to 5,000 square feet in surface measure. Uh, we had submitted for a building permit, and then don't, don't recall exactly what happened, but everything went to pieces, and we decided to withdraw that application for a building permit. We could have got a building permit on lot number 29 because it's outside the RP zone, and we are allowed, according to the ordinance, to fill 5,000 square feet of surface area on any given lot, and we could have done that. We had a plot plan that was, could have done that. I think, uh, I don't know, I, I would think that Mrs. French and others know that we did not place any fill on lot 27 and lot 30. As I admitted to the planning board, we did put two or three loads on lot 29 in the wetlands outside the RP zone. We have not altered, back to 27, altered lot 27 at all, to my knowledge. 
we grant an easement across that lot to put pipes in, two or three pipes in the ground for the town sewer. Again, I guess I'm sorry today that I ever did it. I will say that the, the story I was told, the 50-foot easement down to the ocean could not be used for those pipes because the grant was given to the town, or the Portland Water District, whoever it was given to, the type of soil in that 50-foot strip of land would not allow those pipes to be installed. Now, I was told that by the Portland Water District. You put pipes in that soil, no, no grant. That's what I was told. I granted the easement. The land value, the third gentleman, third person that spoke, I don't know, I don't have my tax bills with me, but I would have to say that probably, at least in every town I deal in, uh, I guess it's true with Cape Elizabeth, when a homeowner, you get your homeowner's bill for your land, your, your, your taxes, you get a broken down land value and house value. That's the way most of them are done. My land value is absolutely no different than anyone else's. I just get a land tax bill because I don't have a building on the lot. <coughs> the land value for my raw lots is the same exact land value as their land value for lots with a house on it. Uh, reference to Keith's, uh, Mr. French's uh, statement on lot 27 again. Any filth placed on that lot was done in conjunction with the town sewer, not by us. Uh, also, the uh, about the same time, that same 50-foot strip of land that was down to the ocean, um, some time after this all started up, the, the planning board granted, nothing to do with us, granted the people down on the other end of that easement, down towards the ocean, a right to put a new road in that 50-foot right-of-way. I guess it must have meandered along our lot line before it was, there was a road they could travel down there. The planning board approved the extension of the storm sewer that exited there and now exits someplace down in here. They approved that. They hauled gravel in. I didn't haul the gravel in. Someone hauled the gravel in. I didn't give them approval to. It's not on my land. I don't really care. Um, I hope it didn't. All they did, as far as I know, was extend the, the, uh, that storm sewer two or three hundred feet uh, so there wouldn't be as much wet area, area there. That's when these pictures were taken. Those pictures right there, if you look at them real carefully, all along that line, you can see where the old clay tile was buried for the, for the uh, garden up there uh, many years ago. And I guess the last point is, you know, we really aren't developing lots now. As far as we're concerned, we have approved buildable lots, and we're home builders, and we're building homes. Those lots are developed. Everybody, I would think, that bought lots, they'd know those lots were there. Uh, and that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to follow up uh, on Mr. Plummer's comments with a couple of comments of my own. Uh, testimony that Mr. Plummer has provided about the fill uh, indicates that there was nothing improper about the fill. I think that the allegations that were made that they were illegal were simply uninformed allegations. Uh, there is a, uh, a difference, as we uh, mentioned in the beginning, between wetlands and resource protection zone. Uh, the video that was presented, the, uh, all the evidence about uh, what kind of vegetation there is, uh, how wet the land is, all excellent uh, testimony for the issue of whether these are wetlands or not. But that's not the issue before the board this evening. The issue before, excuse me, the board, the town council this evening, is whether this is a properly uh, zoned as a resource protection district and, uh, or not. Uh, Mr. Uh, Plummer has also already uh, referred to the fact that um, uh, the uh, residents that have testified here tonight uh, uh, bought with reference to a subdivision plan. 
the lots were designated as housing uh, lots, uh, there is a, no equity issue there. With regard to the stubs being put in, uh, as is uh, mentioned in one of the uh, letters before the town council, the stubs, uh, the sewer stubs were put in at the recommendation of the town of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, uh, finally, uh, with regard to the uh, testimony that the uh, lots are valued at $4,000, that of course is the, uh, the tax appraisal. The uh, valuation uh, looked at by the courts is uh, the market value of property as buildable lots or not buildable lots. Uh, finally, uh, we we want to emphasize that the uh, issue before the town council is uh, whether uh, this, these lots are Sebago Mucky Pete, which is what Dr. Uh, Rand has testified was the basis on which uh, the resource protection zone uh, lines were drawn. And uh, if, if not, then the uh, zone uh, designation should be removed. It should be removed in any case because of the issue of taking. Thank you. Yes. May I speak again? If there's new information, yes. Yes, it is. Well, it's uh, in, in reference to something he said and mm -hmm. I said, uh, it's a fact. Mark Plummer <coughs> did not fill Lot 27. That was done in conjunction with the sewer, and we all saw it, and unfortunately we had our blinders on and didn't know what was going on. What did happen was that um, at Mark, you know, the... the uh, road was put in on top of where the sewer easement was and at Mark Plummer's request the road was moved off of his property um, so that it so that he would have a full-size lot um, I don't really care who filled it I'm concerned about my basement and what the effect of fill anywhere is going to do to my basement I'm really concerned about that um, let's see the other thing was um, in relation to the permit for dumping. Um, well, regardless of what the town says he can do on the other lots, it, it's really irrelevant because he will need an Army Corps permit, as stated by both the Army Corps of Engineers and the EPA. No, not even a truckload of fill allowed until he gets those. I would just like to reiterate, uh, this is in your packet, this is the letter that uh, so far only our side has mentioned this. This is from the Department of the Army, the Army Corps of Engineers, it's signed by Mr. J. Clement, which, with whom uh, we've spoken to um, on many occasions. Now we've highlighted for you the very key phrases in this. Whether or not a person has building permits and the land is ready to go, this is the federal government. And there is a process that has to be gone through, has to be enacted before any building can take place whatsoever. Um, it's, it's very clearly highlighted here. Uh, lot 29, that was illegal. Yeah, I don't think we ever even mentioned that 27 was filled, by the way. That, that's something that uh, is just uh, a misunderstanding. What happened there was the road. I own cottages down in Peebles Cove, and I know what we went through trying to get that road through. And I know we had to prove that it was wetlands and we had to go through hell to meet the criteria to get that road in. It could only be 10 feet wide. Uh, the owner of Peebles Cove, the lady who owns the land, had most of her land taken by eminent domain, fought it for years. I, I think that the easement, one way or the other, for the sewer pipe would have gone through because eminent domain doesn't care. They take it. And that went on for, for many, many, many years on Peebles Cove. The owner of Peebles Cove really fought it very, very hard. So one way or the other, whether or, one, whether or not one was given, it would have been taken. The Army Corps of Engineers is um, very closely watching this particular case, as is the DEP and the EPA. The EPA has come out several times. We've been in uh, contact with Ms. Pam Shields, who was the head of this entire area. She came all the way from Boston. Her advice to Mrs. French and myself, who were happy to be there that day when she was there, she said, if anybody touches so much as puts a shovel in this, you are to call. She gave us a number to call immediately. He is to cease and desist. So regardless of what happens or what has gone before, nothing is written in stone until he gets through this particular process. And this is happening all over the country. The federal government is tired of watching our coastlines polluted, 
our wetlands filled in, and certainly not at the public interest. It is the, at the interest of people trying to obviously make a living, build their houses, very, very nice. Um, we're fooling now with the federal government, and this is just since it's just never mentioned. We keep mentioning Sebago Monkey Pee until it's coming out of our ears. This is what's important. This right here. And Mr. Plummer has been served this, and it is signed by Mr. J. Clement. Um, it's all been highlighted for you. So I, I just would please reiterate, please read this over very, very carefully. Thank you. I will be brief, <laughs> but I do take exception, I have a hard time with that word, uh, to the property values. Mr. Plummer said that his are valued at, uh, on the recent valuation, same as ours. No. Our land is valued at 33000 Those lots are valued at the average of 10000 They are not the same. As far as even Mr. Plummer's um, Sebago Technics, they submitted their report and they said, to uh, relate to lots 30 and 44, it's our opinion based on soil, bo soil borings we conducted on both lots that these areas are primarily fill. The fill placement on lot 30 is relatively recent, perhaps most of it having been done in the last two years. That is his own soils analyst. And that was given to the planning board by Mr. Plummer. Um, we're not saying, as my, uh, Keith French said, we're not saying he did those other ones. The, the concern is don't change an RP zone because of fill. It is a dangerous precedent. There will be other developers lining at your door. There's one already waiting to see what will happen. Is there any further public comment that would add new information to what has been presented over the last hour and a half? Uh, I'm Mark Plummer. I never requested anyone to move any road. The Portland Water District, the Town of Cape Elizabeth, the Corps of Engineers, the Environmental Protection Agency, when granting that easement on Lot 27, are supposed to seed that area over and loma. I don't know if that's been done yet or not, but I did not request ever any road to be moved off from Lot 27. I didn't even know where the lot line was until I had the lot survey. So I, ju I just never made that uh, that request. Uh, we have been. I have that letter. Mr. Clement, we have not done any work since that. I know what I have to do. The law is changing very rapidly in that area. Uh, a year ago at this time, those small areas they didn't care about. Today they do. The Department of Environmental Protection has absolutely no interest in that area. We've been to see them. They've been out and looked, and they've given us a letter saying they, that does not come under their jurisdiction. The Army Corps of Engineers and the EPA, unfortunately, uh, you have to satisfy both. You satisfy the core, and the EPA can boot you out the door. You, have, you satisfy the EPA, and if the Corps of Engineers doesn't like what you're doing, uh, they can boot you out the door. So you have to satisfy both. <coughs> we do have, or had had, did have, an application in for all of those lots over there at Eastfields, which I withdrew uh, about uh, two or three weeks ago. Uh, my own reasons, and uh, we'll take care of those types of issues um, as they come up. Thank you. Any further? I'd like to add one point, and that is with regard to the issue of Could you just come forward yes, just because sorry. we are televised here? Right. With regard to the issue of the uh, Corps of Engineers, the EPA, the DEP regulations, the uh, Maine Law Court has recently ruled that a uh, local body is, uh, has the jurisdiction to uh, review and to make its decisions based on its own ordinances and its own regulations and the w regulations of other bodies such as the DEP and the EPA Job, job Corps uh, are, excuse me, the Corps of Engineers uh, are irrelevant and should not be taken into consideration. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, would anyone else, ladies and gentlemen, would anyone else like to make any statements as we continue and move towards wrapping up the public hearing. Yes, I see someone in the back. Come forward, please. My name is Dorothy O'Reilly. I live a little bit up the dirt road from these people, not in Eastfield. I'm on Peebles Cove. My family have been there for 20 years. Eight years ago, I bought property myself there. 
1981, I became very much aware of this RP zone. We were all very, very happy, the entire area. And I just would like to question Mr. Plummer's statement at the very beginning of this hearing when he said he was not aware of that being an RP zone. And it would seem to me anyone with a vested interest, as indeed he has a vested interest, would not know of this matter when everyone on Peebles Cove knows about it. Thank you. Are there any further comments on the public hearing regarding the rezoning requests at Eastfield? Okay, seeing none, I would then officially close the public hearing portion of this and move on to our first agenda item, which is item number 21, to consider public hearing comments on a proposed rezoning of five lots at Eastfield from the RP to RA and take any necessary action. We certainly have... Uh, tremendous amount of information in front of us and we've had uh, excellent presentations on both sides of which we as a council are grateful to have this type of a public hearing and all the work that we know goes into it on both sides. But I would now like to open the discussion up to my fellow councillors regarding this item. Councillor Amaro. Uh, I'd like to ask the town manager to explain why those steps were put in for those five lots. Uh, they were not I'd, I'd be happy to, Mrs. Amaro. Uh, I think, you know, there was a letter referenced uh, by some of the members of the public tonight, which was written, I believe, to Mrs. Rachel Perry uh, in, find it here in the stack, Put it in. <coughs> Thanks, which was written in, on April 14th of 1987. Uh, in late 1986, the uh, cable, one of the cable boards, I believe it was the zoning board, uh, ruled on a matter involving a dirt road uh, up in the, the Broad Cove subdivision. Uh, in, I believe it was August of 1985, uh, uh, R.J. Grondon, the sewer contractor, uh, began to place a dirt road in an area within a subdivision uh, where there had been an early dirt road but it was widened out and quote unquote improved upon. Uh, a group of residents uh, led by, I believe, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Edward Perry uh, led a move to challenge uh, the filling of that road. Uh, after some discussion, the zoning board ruled uh, that uh, it was not grandfathered. Uh, the, the earlier understanding, in, in fact, the earlier advice of the town attorney said that it had been grandfathered. Uh, when those, dis at that point, the stubs were already in on Eastfield Road. Uh, Eastfield Road, the town was going along on the premise at that point that the lots were grandfathered uh, and I think that explains some of the information uh, that Mr. Plummer was giving in our building, building inspector's office. Until the decision came along on the Perry Appeal, the town was informing uh, residents, property owners, anyone who asked that any lot that had been approved as a buildable lot uh, was grandfathered and that the new restrictions would not apply to it. Uh, that changed with the uh, Perry decision before the zoning board. that answer your question? Yes. Good. Other councils? Yes, Council Codd. I would like to ask Michael um, about the taxing over these years. Um, that has been taxed as an undeveloped lot or a fully buildable lot. Do you know over these years? I, I, I have not years? checked the individual assessment records, and I, I would not want to categorize the assessment. Other councillors would like to make comments now? <coughs> Councillor Jordan? Yes, that's a, that's a question in my mind, and I had it written down here. Once that was put into the IP zone, did they get a reduction on their taxes as far as the individual lots, or did the town continue to tax them as buildable lots? My, my understanding is we, we taxed them as we had before because we were, on, we were operating under the impression that they were grandfathered and were still buildable lots. Yes, Councilor Mann. Uh, Michael, I'd like to ask you about the allegation that uh, the developer never received notice of the change in the zone. He mentioned um, a hearing having to do with topsoil removal, and I do remember that. <coughs> Could you give us the date of that and tell us whether or not the 
uh, change of zone in the in, uh, geese field was telescoped into that proceeding? There was uh, what either Mr. Plummer or Mrs. McGee he was referring to, I'm not, I don't remember which one at this point, was a hearing December 14th, 1981. It was advertised in the paper as, uh, uh, again, which, uh, which amendments would revise the provisions regulating removal of topsoil or other earth materials, would alter certain existing zoning districts and designations, and would establish the minimum residential lot size in the less dense residence A district. Uh, that, that was uh, a legal ad in the paper. Notices were not sent to residents. Uh, for those of you who have been on the council sometime, may remember there was an ice cream takeout stand uh, that the town council subsequently changed the zoning on because uh, it, uh, they had not been notified and a whole lot of other reasons. It, that involved a business district, not a resource protection district. Uh, no, notices were not sent out uh, to all the residents, although uh, this legal ad was placed in the newspaper. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Other comments from the town council on this matter? Um, we also see that Marion Guthrie from the uh, planning board is in the audience, which we appreciate your attendance <coughs> this evening. If there's any questions also for her. Um, I guess at that, at this point, I would like to move on item 21, and we can continue our discussion, but I would like to move uh, that the request for a zone change uh, in this area from RP to RAB. I'll second. And I'd like to speak to it. Okay, it has been moved and seconded, seconded that this request for the zone change be denied. For the purposes of discussion, now we will continue the discussion. Okay, I, I just would like to say, first off, that I feel that the planning board went through an extremely extensive process of reviewing all of this material, much more extensive than what we have done. Uh, that I respect the decision uh, that the planning board has made, first of all, was a unanimous decision that this request be denied. Uh, I think it's unfortunate in a way that we have to go through a second public hearing and ask everybody else to come out again, but I think it does protect everyone's rights. And I truly am, am impressed with the people who have shown up tonight, the research that has been done, and the amount of effort that has been put in uh, to, uh, to this whole item. I also understand the frustration that uh, Mr. Plummer must be feeling uh, tonight, but I do think we have a very uh, difficult process in, in Cape Elizabeth that developers have to go through now, and I, and I think that the pictures and all that we saw tonight uh, explain why we have that process. So I, I would like to thank everybody who has, who has stood fast and who has sh shown such great staying power with us, and I want to personally thank all of you for being here. Thank you, Councilor Amaro. Further discussion from the Council on the motion that is now before us. I would like to say that the establishment of the resource protection zones was not come to very easily. Um, that was a long, long study process um, that is being re studied, I understand, to a degree, but that it was for the overall benefit of the town. And I feel very strongly that any encroachment on the resource protection district ultimately does not benefit the town. With um, the drainage problems that can be created by allowing garages to be built and sometimes roadways. Very good, thank you. Other councilors? Councilor Jordan. Yes, I, ju I just like to say, and it really disturbs <coughs> me in the process that went through here and not notifying the people involved as far as a uh, change being made. And I would think that it would be in the best interest of the town to notify all these people. And then we continue to uh, bill them as a buildable lot the procedure really bothers me, and bothers me strongly. And uh, I'm not saying that they shouldn't be in the RP zone. I think I know that feel. I said Eastfield never should have been built when they built it in the first place. And my father said the same thing, because it was nothing but a 
swampy hayfield. They could only farm it once in five years, but they did. They was allowed to do it. It happened to win in the right cycle, and they managed to get their perk tests and what have you, which was required at that time. So the project was moved forward. I think a lot of the problems that the water that we see there now is due to the construction that's been done there, and I think a lot of it is where the dozer's been in there and made some tracks, marks, and what have you, and they've grown up over the years. And without a doubt, you're going to get that type of vegetation if you've got the water that stands there with uh, any time or any month or any uh, long period of time, you'll get that type of vegetation to grow up. But like I said, the, the history of the place, and I think it's too bad that they got caught into a deal here where they thought that they had the buildable lots or they was taxed as buildable lots, and then we turn around and change Horses in the middle of the stream, and I don't think that's right, but I shall support the planning board's decision. Very good. Other councils? Yes, Council Creelman. I'd just like a clarification from the town manager. Since there are, there are five lots in question, uh, lot 44, uh, as of yesterday morning, has a, has a lovely home sitting on it. Uh, here on this blueprint, we, we have just a foundation here. There is indeed a home. What is the, the issue with regard to these five lots as, as buildable lots? There are four that potentially could have a home on them. But lot 44 has a home already, but we're talking about a corner, uh, a small corner of that lot. Is that basically the issue? The, the building is a moot point. The home is already there. Yeah, it, um, yeah lot 1-44, it, as you explained, it is just a small corner of it where the home was built was not within the Resource Protection District, and according to the ordinances, uh, it could be built. I, I can't speak from uh, the applicant, but I assume they asked for it just to square off the lot lines rather than to leave that one little triangle that would be left. Can I get a clarification on that? <coughs> Very good. Councilor Masterton. Well, uh, I knew we were going to have a big hearing on this tonight, so I made sure to go down today and take a look at this property with my little map. And I, I want to say to you people down there in Eastfield, you sure are growing a wonderful crop of wonderful wildflowers and weeds. I was very impressed with the wild tansy that is just right there. Um, my feeling is that if we allow Mr. Plummer to uh, fill those lots and build upon them. We would just be pressing the water someplace else into Mr. French's basement, further on down People's Cove Way. Um, you just can't get rid of it. And somebody said that, that DEP is not very concerned about wetlands. I serve on the Board of Environmental Protection, and I can tell you that we are very, very concerned about the filling of wetlands. And we have turned down innumerable applications of late. Um, people applying to build a home and fill in a wetland. So um, the DEP is concerned, and I personally am concerned. And I think that we should preserve these wetlands as very precious assets in Cape Elizabeth. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Greenlaw. Thank you, Chairman. I'm going to vote in support of Jane's motion on this issue, and I want to let you know why. I do work with these issues professionally. I can certainly understand the frustration of a developer. I deal with frustrated developers in my work. We work with a variety of towns, a variety of zoning ordinances. You know the responsibility of your consultants in keeping you abreast of zoning ordinances, both local and state, the new state ordinance and all the federal ordinances that may apply. I think one thing that I'm thankful for for this process is we've gone through it, people have persevered. I do appreciate the work put forth 
on both sides of this issue. I would ask your pre appreciation of the boards who have been hearing this issue, both planning board and your town council. It was a quick study for me as a new counselor over the weekend to put in a number of hours becoming much better acquainted with the ordinances than I had previously been. I thought I knew them pretty well. I know them a lot better. I thank you for that forced opportunity, I guess, to <laughs> become so acquainted with them. I'm very much in support of the RP zone. I did notice my name was probably the only current counselor's name on the petition. That was before I chose to run for town council, however. <laughs> yes, we can improve our process. I thank you for bringing that to light, Mr. Former. I will work very hard to see that our process is improved. I thank both sides for your work in this issue. I support the RP zone. Thank you very much. Are there any other comments by uh, our council? <clears throat> the only comments that I would like to make after hearing all and then reading also over the weekend is the fact that, once again, I want to point out to the public that the planning board has recommended in a lengthy finding to us five to nothing in, this, uh, in terms of uh, denying this request. And two statements that really come out to me in those findings are very simple ones, but they boil down the issues. One is that it states the existing condition of lots 31 and 32 and the designated portions of 27, 30, and 44 are that of a wetland and that the town had adequate criteria to designate this area as an RP district. The, the protection of these resource protection areas is utterly critical to a very fragile ecology and that we have to stand behind them when it's been determined that in fact it needs to be. These are the present conditions that exist. We can't do anything to change them. We need to protect them no matter what the situation to protect this incredibly del delicate ecology that has been talked about earlier so that others that are in the town can continue to live uh, happily without having to have sub pumps uh, continually re replaced every year. So I see no reason that has been presented in order to move these from the RP to the RA zone. Thus, I also will be support supporting Councilor Amaro's uh, motion. That is my summary. And, uh, are there any other comments from the Council? If not, we will have a vote on the issue. All those in favor of the motion that is on the floor to deny the request, please signify by raising your hand. <coughs> are there any opposed? It passes unanimously, seven to zero. <clears throat> Once again, our sincere thanks to both sides for the, cl the clear presentations, all the research and, and time and money that has gone into this. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Primary burner when you squeeze the trigger on. It's a really abrupt. No, I'm going to in just about uh, a minute. Like an explosion. They don't come in. Ex right, it just, it's just a quick burst. Uh, we have a secondary means of getting propane to the burner in case there's a problem with the primary means. That works on a We're on a going to move on in so this case. So you can turn it on gradually, and it doesn't have that... We have item noise. number 22 under so consideration right now, which is a report from caught. the planning board on proposed amendments to the zoning ordinance regarding housing for the elderly and take any necessary action. What we have before us is on July 19th, 1988, the planning board approved zoning ordinance uh, changes regarding the housing for the elderly. Changes in this area included uh, definitions such as the definition of congregate housing, nursing homes, etc., and also other clarifications and definitions such as density provisions, site requirements, parking restrictions, etc., regarding uh, congregate care and nursing homes. So what we have then is this uh, planning board approved zoning ordinance and text changes regarding this particular issue which is before us this evening. Is there any council that would like to make any comments regarding item number 22? I have a question. Yes. Um, I, I wondered if someone from the planning board, I don't know if she's here. I think she's still outside. I wondered how they arrived <coughs> at the setback. We don't, we don't have a, a representative of the planning board has left. Um, I don't no, believe she's just outside. She's cooling on us. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments while we're waiting to see if Marion returns? Councilor Krillman? I have one question about the age of 62 uh, that is apparently the definition of uh, the elderly here. Uh, how is this? Uh, I see our representative from the planning board has returned and you might like to just keep walking up to the microphone. <laughs> 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 <laughs
Marion Guthrie from the planning board. Yes, I have the dubious, the dubious distinction of being on the planning board. What was your question? I was outdoors getting some air. I'm melting in here. We'll start. We had two questions. Councilor Masterton had the first. Yes. Marion, how did the planning board arrive at the setbacks? Uh, well, uh, a great deal of research was done, and uh, I hope you won't quote me on it. I don't have any of the minutes with me. But uh, I do believe that our planner did a great deal of research on many ordinances, and that's how we arrived at that. Um, does the Viking Nursing Home set a kind of rule? How, how far is that set back? Do you know? I don't recall. Thanks. Okay. We had also a question from Councilor Crowley. I had a question, Mr. <laughs> Guthrie, about the... Uh... I don't have any information on my person. So I'll do the best I can, just off the top of my head. I had asked how the age of 62 had been arrived at. Um, I think that's uh, the, uh, the developer uh, and people associated with this new concept of congregate care use that as a, a mean sort of number. But, you know, I, I would assume that it would be flexible depending on who needed the care. I mean, give or take a few years. I assume there would be flexibility. I hope it wouldn't be totally rigid. I, I would agree with that uh, thought. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other comments or questions? Yes. Councilor Jordan. The procedure, the procedure of this is to go to the zoning the ordinance committee, or are we here to adopt it as is? Uh, to the, the ordinance, ordinance committee. Well, that's what I thought. I have, I have quite a few questions, and and one is park at parking places, and I don't know how they come up with that. And also, it's mostly in the parking. I guess they figure if everybody was working there, and the boys took up all the spaces, they would be. And somebody had a vehicle there, there'd be no company. I guess is that what they figure? Nobody could visit. One parking space for each residential unit shall be provided. In addition, the employees' parking spaces that equal to the highest number of employees on duty. So if you had the highest number of people was there, maybe they figure everybody don't work every day, so you never have a high number. And uh, during one shift shall be provided, it says. So everybody was home, and all the employees was there. Where would somebody go? To visit park. I think uh, you know, that that certainly you know could be changed through the review process. Uh, my understanding of facilities like this is that they they do plan that not everyone living in the facility will have a vehicle. Uh, so you know the numbers of units uh, vehicles per units would in fact be less than one, and the difference between the the amount less than one uh, they feel is customarily sufficient to provide for visitors. Of course, Kate might want to look at that and develop another standard with a limited public transportation. Well, I, I think we ought to take a look at it. Any more, Councilor Jordan, or is that? Councilor Amber? I, I had oh. one on the okay. setbacks also. Mm -hmm. I'll go into that later. <clears throat> Councilor Amber? Uh, on the parking, I'd like to see the audience committee, if we could send us to the audience committee, consider visitors, vis visitors talking about at least with the congregate here. I think there will be people that will have more than one cast. And we'll take up some of those spots. Do we have a motion? No. No, not yet. Uh, I, move, I move that uh, we refer this to the Ordinance Committee. Second motion. Okay, it's been moved and seconded, and I would now like to open this up to the public as we do with all agenda items. Is there anyone from the public that would like to speak on this issue regarding the pr proposed uh, text changes in this ordinance? Yes. Good evening. My name is Richard Fortinsky. I live at 33 Longfellow Drive. And I have two questions and then a few comments regarding the lack of clarity, uh, which I believe is represented in this draft of the zoning ordinance. Uh, my first question would be who requested these changes? And my second question would be who is on the ordinance committee, just for future reference uh, for myself as a citizen. Okay, very good. They may be, you can answer those after uh, I go through my comments or answer them now. Uh, Mr. Manager would like to answer the okay. first one, our town manager. Yeah, I, First Atlantic Corporation requested some amendments to the zoning ordinance. They did not request these specific amendments. 
Thank you. Okay. And uh, Councillor Masterton is the chairman of the Ordinance Committee and also serving on that as Councillor Cogshell and Councillor Jordan. Thank you. Okay. I, at this point, I would just like to, uh, what I have before me is a copy of the sixth draft of the Housing for the Elderly Ordinance language, and I just would like to share my concerns, really, about the lack of specification, I believe, ex that exists in some of the clauses. Uh, I think where I'll, I will start is on the second page, which says create new zoning ordinance provision under the density issue. What is listed here is, is some specifications about density for congregate housing and also specifications for density for nursing homes. However, there is nothing about the density for a continuing care retirement community. On the very first page where several definitions are listed and, and an effort is made to distinguish between them, a continuing care retirement community is simply called a facility that provides a combination of nursing home and congregate housing services. If a developer is interested in building something that they define as a continuing care retirement community, at this point we have absolutely no density language listed in this draft. And that concerns me greatly because that sounds to me like there's quite a lot of arbitrary range there that could exist. And I would, at the very least, like to see some specification about what the density would be for a continuing care retirement community. On the next page, under minimum lot size, it's, it is stated that the minimum lot area shall be 20 acres for housing for the elderly and 5 acres for nursing homes. Well, looking back at the definitions, it appears that a nursing home is actually subsumed under housing for the elderly. So it seems to be a bit confusing to say that 20 acres for housing for the elderly and then five acres for nursing homes, which is apparently under the definitions, a type of housing for the elderly. So I believe that's a bit confusing. Um, under uh, the buffering issue, which is number six under site requirements, I just simply think that that's vague. Uh, words like adequate landscaping uh, simply, t to me, aren't, aren't aren't specific enough and as an abutting property to a potential site for one of these types of housing for the elderly, I'd really like to see that language specified to talk about what adequate would be. Uh, continuing on that same page under parking standards, I really have the same issue as I had with the density issue, which is that parking standards are specified here for congregate housing, they are specified for nursing homes, but again they are not specified for continuing care retirement communities. Under community impact statement, uh, my question there would be how up to date would a community impact statement have to be compared to the date of the application itself? In other words, if a community impact statement were done two years before the application or six months before, I would just like to see that language specified, how, how recent that would have to be. And finally, under the market and feasibility study clause, that language again is vague. It says the planning board may require the applicant to submit a market and feasibility study. I would like to see conditions specified under which this would be required. Uh, that really should be specified. And also what should be specified is how recent such a study should be compared to when the application is made. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other public comments regarding this issue? And once again, I just wish to remind the public that the process here is we'll be voting on this motion in just a few minutes. And it will then go to the Ordinance Committee where it will be looked at from many different angles regarding the three that I mentioned that are on the Ordinance Committee. They will then make a presentation back to the Town Council who will then set it for public hearing. So those people who are interested in this, and I know there are a lot of people who are interested in this, please keep abreast of that particular process because we will be, once again, as I say, having a report from the Ordinance Committee to here, and then we will set it to a very important public hearing that will happen, at which that same evening we will vote on it. So I, I'm just, once again, clarifying for everyone what the process is, even though we are accepting public comments, as we do all the time. We're accepting them tonight as well. We have a motion before us, I believe. Okay, yes, yes. Councilor Greenlaw. I'd like to speak on this somewhat. I would like to recommend that the Ordinance Committee consider a definite dimension for the buffer. I would put forth a 30-foot minimum for the buffer for them to consider. I would also like them to consider that a building not exceed a set number of contiguous units. Also to consider 
except a building length not to be exceeded and building separation both end to end and rear to rear. I have a couple of outstanding concerns with this wording. I'm concerned about the 20 acre minimum lot size. I do serve on the Affordable Housing Committee. Okay, what, what I'm looking at is 20 acres <coughs> minimum lot size with a density of six units per net residential area. Net, net residential acre. And I would like the ordinance committee to consider decreasing the number of acres or increasing the number of units per net residential area to assist with the affordability issue. <coughs> I did have one citizen comment on this. A concern about the amount of traffic that would be generated by this kind of development, especially in existing residential areas with school children who are walking to and from school. And I think there needs to be some attention paid to the provision of sidewalks in areas where that may happen. And the access to this kind of development through existing neighborhoods. Thank you, Councillor. Are there other comments? Yes, Councillor Jordan. Yeah, I just, I just want to say that if anybody has picked up a copy of this and has any comments that I would like to have them, they could forward it to the chairman of the ordinance committee or forward it to the town manager and he'd get it to the proper people. And I would like to hope the ordinance committee will again to go to work on this so we can move this forward because I think it's something that is needed and I, I would like to see it in the town of Cape Elizabeth because I feel there's some people that would enjoy that type of, of living because I know some couple that had gone, uh, two different people that had gone out to Falmouth to theirs, that one that they have out there and they're very pleased with it and I think they are, are nice for elderly people that live alone and they have some little supervision. Thank you, Councillor. I would, I would also like to just add that a few years ago we had a workshop where we discussed this in depth and we had people from all, all throughout the community come and talk on this issue, uh, which happened to be some members of, of an expanded board that was there. But one thing that did develop was in terms of affordability. What type of facilities do we want in this town? And uh, one was suggested maybe uh, there's some very expensive elderly care facilities that are throughout the country where it, where it requires a tremendous amount of money, not only as a down payment to get in, but then a monthly fee as well, which, which would probably equate out to 0.2% of the population could afford it or something. So I think affordability is extremely important, and I hope the Ordinance Committee will look into that as well in terms of perhaps some of the, what I would call more expensive type of, of uh, elderly facilities which could develop would have a certain section put aside of, of uh, lower income or more affordable units. But I'm very concerned to see uh, what I would call ultra high priced when there are many citizens in this town that are on a fixed income or that are mid what you might call middle class means that also are going to need this type of service. So it's really an important issue. We as a town, what type of elderly care do we want to put a focus on in this town given the very limited resources of land that we have? And uh, that was an enlightening discussion that we had, and I'm sure we'll have more. But we, as always, need the citizens to participate to really make this a healthy debate. So I want to just highlight my major concern with this type of ordinance as well. Is there any other comment? If not, we have a motion before us. I'd like to have a vote on the motion to send this to the Ordinance Committee. All those in favor? Any opposed? So unanimously, we move to send it to the Ordinance Committee for the lively discussion I know they will have.